this video, I'll be going over ways to visualize complex valued functions. If you're already familiar with complex numbers, you can skip to part 1. The building block of complex numbers is i, the square root of negative 1. We can multiply any value by i to get what's called an imaginary number. An imaginary number is essentially just the square root of a negative real number. We can consider a complex number z to have a real part a and an imaginary part b. A purely imaginary number can be considered a complex number with real part 0. Likewise, a purely real number can be considered a complex number with imaginary part 0. Adding and subtracting complex numbers is straightforward. We just have to make sure that the real and imaginary parts of the complex numbers are separate from one another. Multiplication and division are a little bit less straightforward, since i squared equals negative 1. When multiplying two complex numbers, you distribute terms as you would with two completely real binomials. However, since we end up with a term containing i squared, we have to make that particular term negative. In this case, we end up with the product of the imaginary components of the two complex numbers being subtracted from the product of the real components of the two complex numbers. When multiplying or dividing any amount of complex numbers, if we encounter i squared or i to an integer power that happens to be of the form 2 plus a multiple of 4, we simply change it to negative 1. Here's an example. Since we just squared the number, and z squared is a function, it would make sense that there would be a way to visualize this function for a set of inputs. Before we get to that though, I want to go over the two ways to express a complex number graphically. One way to represent a complex number is using rectangular form, also called standard form. Here we have a graph representing the complex plane, which contains all the complex numbers. On this graph of the complex plane, the real part of each complex number is determined by its horizontal coordinate. The imaginary part of each complex number is determined by its vertical coordinate. A second way we can represent a complex number is using exponential form. Any complex number can be written in the form r times e to the power of i times theta. It's not really obvious why e would show up here, so I've included a link in the description to a proof of why a complex number can be written like this. In this form, r represents the distance that the complex number is from the origin of the graph. This distance is called the magnitude, modulus, or the absolute value of the complex number. The angle theta represents the angle that the complex number makes with the real number line. This angle is called the phase or the argument of the complex number. It can be very convenient to write a complex number like this in a lot of scenarios. There's one more thing I want to point out. Since complex numbers are two-dimensional, having distinct real and imaginary components, our input isn't going to be restricted to a single one-dimensional line like it would be for our completely real-valued function. In the case of a complex-valued function, the input can be any two-dimensional shape, and so can the output. To start, let's consider the example point from earlier, 2 plus 3i. We'll square the point and see where it goes. We should expect it to go to negative 5 plus 12i. Since there's only a single point associated with the square of this complex number, you may be wondering whether this motion of the point was arbitrary. We should expect a single jump to its square as opposed to a smooth movement. The path wasn't arbitrary though. What this animation shows is actually the exponent of the function z to the power of k changing continuously, and stopping at z squared. This is the particular path that the point follows to its square when the exponent changes in this manner. Obviously here we're only seeing the animation for one point, so to get a better idea of what happens to an entire piece of the plane when we apply this function, we can look at a grid of points. At z squared, we see this symmetrical distribution of the points. Obviously these points are the ones that would map back to a square grid if we took their square root, 
though it would be hard to tell this if we didn't already know. Zooming out even more, we can see that the grid seems to fold in on itself during the transformation from z to z squared. Here's what it looks like if the exponent goes beyond 2 in the animation. Instead of using discrete points, we can use continuous lines to represent the inputs and outputs of a transformation in the plane. At the beginning of the video, the image labeled conformal map shows what a square grid of continuous lines would transform to if passed through the function z over the quantity z squared minus 3. A conformal map is essentially just a function in the complex plane that leaves the angle between the intersections of continuous grid lines in the plane unchanged after the transformation occurs. For example, if we start out with a grid of lines which intersect each other at 90 degree angles, then after a conformal mapping is applied, the angles at the intersections will still be 90 degrees. A function must be complex differentiable, or what's called holomorphic, on a set of points in order for it to be a conformal map on that set of points. As the name implies, domain coloring is a technique that we can use to visualize the outputs of a function or transformation in the complex plane using color. Here again, we have our real and imaginary axes. The color represents the phase of the complex number. Every complex number is assigned a color based on the angle it makes with the real number line. This particular graph simply shows the unaltered complex plane. This way, we can see which color is associated with which part of the plane. Using a color map on the side, we can match the color of the output to its corresponding phase. Let's say a complex number has a phase of 42 degrees. By just looking at the color at this point, we can determine from the color map that the phase of the output at this point is roughly pi over 4 radians, or about 45 degrees, which is pretty close to the actual phase. Before we see what happens to the entire graph when we apply the function z squared to the plane, consider again the point 2 plus 3i. The square of this point, negative 5 plus 12i, lies in the yellow region of our unaltered complex plane. Keep in mind this color. Now, if we square all the points in the graph, we get this. Now, look at the location of 2 plus 3i. The color at this point is yellow, just like the color of its square in the first graph of the unaltered complex plane. From this, we can deduce that the phase of the output for this point corresponds with the color yellow. As long as we have a key for matching color with argument, we can roughly determine the phase of any output in the image. Here are some more examples of domain coloring. 
One thing you can do to get even more information about a transformation is superimpose continuous lines on top of a colored image of the plane. This simultaneously shows how a transformation warps grid lines in the plane and how the transformation affects phase. Here's the colored plot for the function z over the quantity z squared minus 3, the function from the beginning of the video. From this image, we can determine the phase of our outputs, but not the absolute value. In order to visualize the absolute value of the outputs for this function, one thing we can do is utilize the third spatial dimension. Now, the z-axis represents the absolute value of the outputs. This representation of the outputs is called a modular surface and these spikes around the undefined points in the plot are called poles. Close to the undefined points, the denominator of the function becomes extremely small. Regardless of which direction we approach plus or minus the square root of 3 from, the output will tend toward infinity. To make sure that this makes sense, let's go over how to determine the output of a random point in the plane using a colored modular surface. This flat plane represents our input space. Each complex number we use as an input can be described by a position on this flat plane. Now that the added spatial dimension represents the modulus of the output, we can interpret a distance from the origin along the z-axis as how far the output lies from the origin of the complex plane. Let's say that the height of this point on the surface is 0.5. That means that the modulus of the output for this point is 0.5. To find the phase of the output for this point, we can just look at the color at the point on the surface. Putting it all together, we find that the output of this point is about 0.5 times e to the power of i times pi over 2. There's one more way to visualize the outputs of a function that I want to talk about. If instead of letting the third dimension represent the modulus of the output, we can let it represent the real or imaginary part of the output. This is called a Riemann surface. As an example, this image shows the real part of the output of the natural logarithm of z near the origin. As we approach the origin on our input plane, the plot funnels down toward negative infinity. <laughs> 
The funnel flattens out as we look farther away from the origin. Since the one shown here only depicts the real part of the function, we need a separate 3D surface for the imaginary component of the outputs. Using the third dimension for the imaginary component, we get this. Again, looking farther from the origin, we can see the surface flatten out. Before moving on, there's something I want to explain. The complex natural logarithm has an infinite number of outputs for every input on the complex plane. To understand the difference about these outputs, we need to think about them in polar form. If a complex number of the form r times e to the i theta is the natural logarithm of another complex number, then so is every other complex number of the same magnitude with a phase that differs by some integer multiple of 2 pi. We can't describe these numbers as different in rectangular form, but we can in exponential form. What makes them different is the number of times they wind full circle in the plane. Going back to our plot, we see that when traveling up or down the surface, we eventually reach this discontinuity at the edge. It looks like this surface doesn't quite work, but since we know that there are an infinite number of outputs for the complex natural logarithm at each input, we can extend this particular plot by copying and pasting this single spiral an infinite number of times, connecting the top edge of one to the bottom edge of another each time we do this. What we end up with is a continuous, infinitely ascending and descending spiral staircase that tells us not only the imaginary component of the output, but also how many times the number has wound around the origin of the complex plane. The three-dimensional plots in this video were made using Blender, a free open-source 3D graphics software. It's pretty amazing how far the software can go considering it's free. In Blender, you can install what are called add-ons, extra scripts that enable you to do more things. So what I've tried doing is making a few small add-ons that allow you to plot complex-valued functions. First, you can head to the GitHub page where the code is located. <laughs> 
Simply download the Python files from here and save them to any folder you want. Once Blender is open, the next thing to do is click Edit in the top left corner, then Preferences, which will open a small window. In the Preferences window, click Add-ons, then click Install around the top right hand corner. This will bring up a file search window. From there, simply find the Python files from earlier and click on them to install them. Now when you search for Modular Surface or Remon Surface, the option to enable the add-on will be available in the add-on menu in the Preferences window. Simply click the small box beside the name of the add-on to enable it. Now that the add-ons are installed, to add a plot to the viewport you can simply click Add, Mesh, and all the way down at the bottom of the menu there should be an option to add a modular surface and a real or imaginary Remon surface. Simply click on one of these options and you should see the default function in the viewport. A small box with the name of the add-on will pop up in the bottom left hand corner of the viewport. Most of the 2D plots in this video were made using a Python library called matplotlib. There's a lot that you can do with it, but too much for me to talk about right now in this video. For more information, I suggest checking out the website for matplotlib. The code is pretty straightforward, so now I'll mention the last thing. I want to mention this online plotter that I found. This website works really well for plotting just about any function. I'll have a link to it in the description. Thanks for watching, I hope you got something out of this video.